Okay, well, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Felicity Gerry. Uh, I'm Queen's Counsel at Libertas Chambers, and with me today is Dr. Beatrice Krebs, one of our academic members at Libertas Chambers. This is the next in our series of Libertas lectures or Libertas webinars. Um, we're delighted that you can join us to discuss causation and joint enterprise. Largely, this web webinar will focus on how law and practice is still problematic post the decision in the case of Jogi, in which I led for the defence, if you didn't already know, I have to mention it at least once a day, um, the infamous decision that expunged parasitic accessorial liability and apparently restated the law, but there are still problems around the law of complicity that we're going to discuss uh, today and hear our lecture from our expert Beatrice Krebs today. I think it's fair to say that most of you who are here today will be acutely conscious that there are real concerns that far too many people are being convicted as being complicit in someone else's crime. What you may not know is one of our grounds of appeal in Jogi was really a statement rather than a question for the Supreme Court, but it was that joint enterprise over criminalizes secondary parties. Now that ground of appeal, if you like, or that certified question was never directly answered in the decision in Jogi, but properly read, uh, I think I can fairly say that we think that Jogi was intended to confine the way in which accessorial liability works. But post Jogi, there are concerns that that confining exercise is not happening. And at present, there is seemingly no break on who can be charged and convicted, and an argument at least that Jogi is not being properly followed. So to explore these issues in detail, I'm going to hand over for about half an hour to our expert, Dr. Beatrice Krebs from the University of Reading and also our academic member. Welcome Beatrice, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we can, I can certainly see your slides on screen. I shall shut up now and hand over to you. Um, we're very grateful to hear your expertise, thank you. Thank you very much Felicity and thank you also for your kind introduction. Um, and a very warm welcome to everyone who is joining us tonight. Um, so what I'm going to talk about obviously today is uh, on the topic of causation and joint enterprise. And what my research in this area um, is showing is actually uh, two things. First of all, that six years after Jogi, there still is some confusion around the concept of causation and the use of causation language context of complicity. And secondly, that there seems to be some reluctance on part of our courts and the Court of Appeal in particular to apply doctrines of remoteness and specifically to leave the issue of overwhelming supervening acts to juries. Oh, sorry, trying to get the slide to move. Ah, there we go. Now, um, in complicity, causation doesn't really have much of a role to play. And that is because in most instances, it's not at all needed for accessorial liability to arise. As the Supreme Court said in Jogi, and you can see the quote here on the slide. Once encouragement or assistance is proved to have been given, the prosecution does not have to go so far as to prove that it had a positive effect on the principal's conduct or on the outcome. So the prosecution does not have to show that the involvement of the accessory made any difference. And the law does not insist on a causal link in the sense that, but for the accessory's assistance or encouragement, the crime would not have occurred. But some connecting link is clearly presupposed. Assistance and encouragement are not rendered in a vacuum, but the courts have never been able to describe clearly that link or to say what exactly needs to be proven to show that it was there. Now, obviously it is difficult to come up with language that clearly defines the extent of such a link in a way that ensures acceptably consistent application in all instances of complicity. It's, uh, it's a matter of fact that the law cannot be precise, always be precise, but must be practical. However, as I'm sure Felicity will explain in her part of today's webinar, 
the current law is neither precise nor particularly clear or consistent in how prosecutors go about proving that there was indeed a sufficient link between the accessory's conduct and the commission of the offence. Now, going back to the idea of causation, the fact that the law does not insist on a causal link to begin with does not mean that no limits can be placed on an accessory's liability. And that was recognized by the Supreme Court in Jogi um, when it acknowledged the principle of overwhelming supervening act or OSA for short. Um, specifically, the court explained that there may be cases where anything said or done by the accessory has faded to the point of mere background or has been spent of all possible force by some overwhelming intervening occurrence by the time the offense was committed. Ultimately, it's a question of fact to degree whether the accessory's conduct was so distanced in time, place or circumstances from the conduct of the principal offender that it would not be realistic to regard the principal's offense as encouraged or assisted by it. Um, and the court later on also said that, and this was in the context of murder and manslaughter, that it is possible for death to be caused by some overwhelming supervening act by the perpetrator, which nobody in the defendant's shoes could have contemplated might happen and is of such a character as to relegate his acts to history. In that case, the defendant will bear no criminal responsibility for the death. And those of you who were here last time will know that Felicity and I perceive of OSA, of the Overwhelming Supervening Act Principle, as a concept of remoteness that is informed by fair attribution principles. The reason I mention it again today is that there is still a lot of confusion about OSA and how it relates to causation. Trying to get the slide to move. Oh, here we go. Okay, so um, the perhaps most prominent case that has applied OSA was Anderson at Morris. And here the court pointed out that considered as a matter of causation, there may well be an overwhelming supervening event, which is of such a character that it will relegate into history matters which would otherwise be looked on as causative factors. Now the reference to matter of causation has the potential to mislead. Mislead in so far as it could be misunderstood to suggest that the basis for OSA is the lack of lasting causal impact of the accessory's contribution. Because of what the perpetrator did, the accessory's act of assistance or encouragement does no longer carry through to the principal offense. Now, on such an understanding of OSA, there would be an obvious tension with the restatement of the general principles of complicity and jogi, which are clear, as we saw at the beginning of my talk, um, that accessory liability does not require a causal connection. Although obviously some connecting link falling short of causation is still required. Um, and Felicity will say more about that link and how spurious it seems to be in many cases that are being prosecuted. Now, um, going back to the confusion about causation, complicity and OSA, part of the problem seems to me to be linguistic. When people speak of causation, they do not necessarily mean the same thing. In a narrow sense of, sense of the word, causation refers to a continuing physical reaction chain that links conduct and outcome. As a legal concept, however, causation is often used in a wider sense, which includes evaluative or moral considerations of accountability. And in that sense, it is used to refer to those criminal events which ultimately trigger legal responsibility. And the problem here is that in the case law, there often is no sharp distinction drawn between factual causation on the one hand and legal imputation or attribution of responsibility on the other. And references in the case law to causation might encompass either or both of these ideas which can lead to misunderstandings, and so also in the context of OSA. So let me be very clear, OSA is not about causation in fact. And this was recently confirmed by the Court of Appeal in the case of Grant, um, about which I will say more in a minute. Rather, OSA is about legal accountability. 
some acts of assistance or encouragement may become so immaterial in light of the principal's subsequent act that they should no longer be seen to matter. Or in the words of the Supreme Court, the effect of the overwhelming supervening event is that any assistance is spent. Now, the language used here and elsewhere in the case law masks that what OSA is really about is fair attribution. If the accessory's contribution to the crime is rendered so insignificant by a sub subsequent act that we can no longer in good faith hold him to account, he should be absolved of liability for the act and resulting outcome. So the overwhelming supervening act principle, in other words, is a fair attribution principle that seeks to protect secondary parties from overreach in cases where there is a serious mismatch between what the accessory did and imagined would happen and what actually happened. Now on the slide in front of you, I hope everybody can see it, um, I've given you some quotes from Lord Schulzen. Now these are not taken from any of his cases, but from a paper that he published extrajudicially in a book a couple of, of years before Jogi was decided. And I've included the full citation on the slide in case anyone would like to look it up after the webinar. Now, Lord Toulson was, of course, as I'm sure uh, you know, one of the judges hearing the appeal in Jogi, and he, together with Lord Hughes, wrote the judgment. And I think it is therefore significant, even though the judgment in Jogi is not very clear or explicit on this point, that he seems to have considered that a remoteness principle such as OSA is essentially asking the jury to consider whether it would be just and fair to connect the accessory's conduct with what was in fact then done by the principal offender. Uh, and specifically, specifically, Lord Stolzen said the following things here on the slide. Um, questions of remoteness are inextricably interwoven with a sense of what is fair. It is for the jury applying the common sense and sense of fairness to decide whether the prosecution have proved to their satisfaction and on the particular fact that the perpetrator's act was done with the accessory's assistance and encouragement. And he also um, stated that it is inevitable in practice that the decision whether the perpetrator's act was done with the assistance or encouragement of the accessory should involve there the jury's judgment whether it is a just conclusion. So we can see the theme of fair and just um, plays a major role in his writings here. Now, sorry, slides. I'm a bit reluctant to move tonight. Now, um, what can be said to be fairly attri attributed is subject to social shifts and may therefore change over time. And the cases I have listed here on the slide, I think uh, are good examples to demonstrate such, such shifts uh, within society. But um, what some of these cases also show is that there is a certain reluctance on the part of trial judges to leave the issue of remoteness to the jury in the first place, and then a tendency by the Court of Appeal to refuse leave to appeal or to uphold decisions not to involve the jury. And this is worrying. In particular, I think the Court of Appeal seems to be less willing to let an accessory off the hook on the basis that the weapon used or the manner in which harm was inflicted was significantly more dangerous than what the accessory expected. And for example, in the case of TAS, uh, which is uh, right in the middle of the slide, um, the Court of Appeal confirmed an accessory's conviction for manslaughter. Now, the accessory had appealed his conviction on the basis that he had expected a punch up at the most when the victim was stabbed to death by a knife that he, the accessory, did not know was present at the scene. The Court of Appeal, however, did not think that the difference in weapon amounted to an OSA and did not accept that the issue should have been left to the jury. And this can be contrasted with uh, pre jogi cases like English, where the difference in the weapon used and its level of dangerousness was considered significant and resulted, in fact, in the principal's act no longer being attributed to the accessory. Now, English, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with the case, um, 
this was a situation where the victim was like in Tas was stabbed to death uh, when the accomplice had expected to participate in an attack by means of wooden poles, that is by blunt instruments, not a sharp instrument like a knife. And uh, there are some further examples uh, for you to have a look at here on the slide. These are all cases where um, prior to Jogi, an accessory who intended no more than actual bodily harm or grievous bodily harm um, would have been able to escape liability for a victim's death on the basis that the weapon used or manner in which the victim was, victim was attacked was fundamentally more dangerous than he, the accessory, had anticipated. Um, this new reluctance to even leave this issue to the jury uh, is justified by the Court of Appeal with the development in Jogi and the emphasis in Jogi placed on the accessory's intent. But I think there is a problem with this. And I would argue that when the intent was for the victim to be caused grievous bodily harm, this is a very broad category that ranges from serious or very serious, but non-lethal to life-changing and life-threatening injuries. And the level of risk that an accomplice sets by his acts of assistance or encouragement cannot be entirely disregarded where the harm caused by the principal's actions manifests a commitment to a much greater level of risk than may be manifested by the accomplice's participation. So OSA might have a role to play even where the evidence suggests that the accomplice intended to assist or encourage the principal offender to cause grievous bodily harm. And concomitantly, it can be justified, I think, to give an OSA direction in such circumstances. So what I'm saying is that there is a difference between a knife attack and let's say an attack with a machine gun or rocket launcher. The risks of causing death are present in both cases, but of vastly different magnitudes. Now, one way to acknowledge this might be to ask whether the act or attack that in fact occurred was the kind of act or attack that the accessory intended to assist or encourage. And some progress towards such a test was made in the case of Lange, Lanning and Camille. Now, this case concerned a fight between four people at a tube station that turned into a fatal stabbing. And the principal and accessory were convicted of respectively murder and manslaughter. The accessory appealed, and whilst his appeal was dismissed, the decision is still useful in that the Court of Appeal here distinguished between acts that were merely a predictable escalation of the intended acts of violence and acts that amounted to a genuine supervening act. And in explaining the difference, the court drew a line between acts that were unforeseen by the accomplice, but commonplace in the sense that uh, they were objectively predictable. Someone else, even though the accomplice himself did not see it coming, someone else might have seen it coming, wherefore it is not to be considered as an OSA as defined in Jogi. So acts that were unforeseen but commonplace are on one side of this dichotomy and acts that were, acts that were both unforeseeable and extraordinary and therefore might amount to an OSA um, on the other side. The, fact, uh, the question is of course one of fact for the jury to decide. But the uh, subsequent case of Grant, which I think is the latest reported case in this area, as far as I'm aware, uh, did not engage with this uh, suggestion at all. Now, the applicant in Grant was a passenger in a car that was driven around in search of two men. He anticipated that they might be caused serious harm on foot during a face-to-face -face confrontation. But in fact, the driver then ran both victims down with his car, killing them in a hit and run attack or killing one of them in a hit and run attack. Now, whether the attack with the car might have been foreseen by someone else in the defendant's shoes, even if it was not foreseen by the defendant himself, is not obvious. And I think it would have been prudent for the jury uh, to decide this issue. But they never even got to consider the question as the court found that the OSA principle was not engaged. The Court of Appeal admitted that they could not think, could not readily think of an example or any example where OSA might be engaged. 
showing, I think, how high the bar for OSA to be put in, in front of the jury has actually become. And Grant, I think, is a very good example to show that reluctance of both trial judges and the Court of Appeal to leave issues of remoteness to the jury. Um, I hope we are still good for time. That is yeah, one. Yeah, keep going, finish yeah. your slides, that's all good, thank you. Brilliant, good, because there's, uh, I was gonna say, there's one final point that I wanted to make before handing over to Felicity. Um, and, and, and that is that there are um, other developments in the Court of Appeal that should perhaps have us worried that potentially there is a new reluctance to apply established causation or remoteness principles, which in turn increases the scope of criminal liability. Um, and I want us to consider the following case, the case of Field, which I've mentioned on the slide there. Now, the appellant in that case had pretended to be in a caring relationship with his victim, an elderly man, and he had persuaded the victim to change his, his will in his favor, and then sought to bring about the victim's death in a manner that looked like suicide. It was the prosecution's case that the appellant had supplied the victim with copious amounts of whiskey and encouraged him to drink it in large quantities. The victim was found to have died of acute alcohol toxic tox toxicity, gosh, that's a difficult word for me, uh, possibly in combination with the effects of a sleeping pill. So the um, effect of alcohol combined with a sleeping pill was seen to be uh, the cause of death. Now the appellant submitted that the victim's drinking of the whiskey was a free, deliberate and informed act. And that on the basis of the decision in Kennedy number two, also here on the slide, um, that on that basis of that decision, he should not be treated as having caused or contributed to the victim's death. And in Kennedy number two, of course, um, the victim had self-injected some heroin, which the defendant had supplied. And the court found, uh, that the act of self-injection was deliberate, free and informed, and as such absolved the supplier of the drugs from liability for the subsequent death of the victim. And uh, the idea here was that the volitional act of the victim had set in motion a new chain of causation, irrespective of what had happened before. In field, however, the Court of Appeal agreed with the trial judge that the defendant's undisclosed murderous intent had turned the act of supplying the whiskey to the victim into a cause of the victim's death. Now, it is not obvious to me that Kennedy number two, a House of Lords decision, and Field can be easily reconciled. In Field, the Court of Appeal makes much of the fact that the defendant harbored an undisclosed intention that the victim should die, and that that secret intention changes the nature of their interactions. But intention and causation are separate issues. In my view, holding a person, no matter how dubious their intentions, to account for another person's self-harming conduct is coming quite close to a thought crime. Now, I'm not saying uh, that the outcome in field is not defensible. Yeah, clearly, the appellant behaved in an abhorrent way. Um, but I think it might have been possible to convict him without disapplying established remoteness doctrines, for example, uh, via murder by omission. Yeah, the, on, the, on the basis of the facts as they were described in the Court of Appeal decision, uh, the jury seems to have found that Field had remained present whilst the victim was drinking himself to death. And so when the victim became seriously ill and in need of medical attention, uh, the uh, appellant uh, had become under a duty to care and uh, to take actions uh, to avoid the outcome of death. So it might have been possible uh, quite uh, without um, disapplying Kennedy number two to reach um, a similar outcome on the facts of the particular case. And it may well be that field remains restricted to its uh, own rather peculiar set of facts, but it is an interesting decision that might indicate that the court is perhaps no longer very amendable to absolving defendants of liability on grounds of remoteness. Now, if we change the facts, then we can also see the potential relevance of this case for the law of complicity. For example, if a third party had been involved by supplying the alcohol to the defendant, uh, 
or by encouraging him in his devious plan. Then it might, be, might have been possible to uh, convict another party, perhaps of assistance and encouragement in regard to the victim's death, when before, because of Kennedy number two, there may not have been a principal offense because a free and informed deliberate act uh, was seen to sever the chain of causation. What's more, the decision in field could also be set to entirely circumvent the principles of complicity and make acts of assistance and encouragement the stuff of direct criminal re responsibility. And that I think would be an even more worrying development. So what we can see from the cases that I've mentioned tonight is there is a, a new trend in, in the recent case law to disapply established principles of legal causation or to not uh, leave them to the jury. And, and this has repercussions for, for how broad the scope of criminal liability is becoming and for complicity in particular uh, after, after Jogi. Okay, that's uh, pretty much everything I wanted to say. Brilliant, thank you, Beatrice. I'm hoping everyone can now see and hear me. As always, really thoughtful um, stuff on this very complicated area of law um, that is giving rise, as I said earlier on when I introduced this webinar, to real concerns that far too many people are being convicted as being complicit in some way that is not framed by legal principle and that our ground of appeal or at least certified question in Jogi that joint enterprise over criminalizes secondary parties was not only not directly answered in Jogi but is uh, continuing post the Jogi decision and we've discussed today causation and particularly remoteness principles. Now that um, book chapter that Beatrice told us about, we had that when we took the Jogi appeal. And in fact, I think our opening line in our submissions was taken from it. We could see that Lord Toulson wanted to get rid of parasitic accessorial liability, uh, restate the traditional law of accessorial liability, which is what they did in Jogi, but he was also writing, in my opinion, very clearly about these remoteness principles. And I think they fit very well with limb two of Galbraith, because unless judges exercise a discretion to say this is too remote or this is so tenuous or there really isn't any con solid connectivity here, in the current climate, there is a real risk that someone is convicted when they have little or no connection to the crime by a jury, where we also have lots of myths and stereotypes around how people behave. So I think that these cases where there is a tenuous connection are the sort of cases that the judges should be stopping. And that fits with the decisions that Beatrice has told us about today, where the Court of Appeal has said, well, we don't really want to leave overwhelming supervening act to the jury. Well, obviously it's my view that we should be leaving overwhelming supervening acts to a jury because it should be for a jury to decide what's fair and what's not and who's accountable and who's not and who um, the public can, in the, played by the jury, if you like, decide carries criminal responsibility. But there is all this, also this really, really important role that judges have at the close of the prosecution case to apply legal principles of remoteness and to, to apply them in that confined way that Jogi is telling them to, even though it's not terribly clearly written. The words are all there. Um, it is just a little bit woolly. But you can see a really good example in the decision of... Uh, Lord Justice Fulford in the case of Bassett, a case in which the conviction was quashed, really looking at principles of circumstantial evidence by saying, well, you couldn't ex exclude the realistic possibility that the appellant was acting in panic rather than trying to cover up a crime. So I think these principles of remoteness fit very neatly with the test in circumstantial evidence cases, that prosecution cases have to be able to exclude realistic possibilities. 
And I sort of argue this banging my head against a brick wall in lots of cases. Uh, and when we think about the sort of examples that we're getting, which do, in my opinion, over-criminalise uh, secondary parties or over-criminalise those persons in the dock accused. For example, we now have cases where people are convicted solely on a pattern of telephone calls. We sit through weeks and weeks of evidence of telephone calls, CCTV and so forth, without witness evidence. And certainly there's at least one case that I know of where the uh, person was not present at the scene at all and makes a phone call at a particular time with no real pattern to the phone calls either. So it, somebody convicted without a pattern of phone calls, but with a single phone call and, a, and association. Um, and other people convicted on patterns of phone calls, even if they are a little bit tenuous. Um, other cases where you've got someone who is waiting. So they're not really a lookout, but they're in the area, they've been associating, um, and they're perhaps waiting. They might have some knowledge of something that's going to occur, but does that really give them any real connection with the crime? Does that take them beyond association? It's um, an interesting area to think about. Now I've just lost my notes and got them mixed up with my Zoom. So just hold on a moment and I'll move the Zoom down and find the, the notes. Just two seconds, there we go. Uh, yes, other cases, for example, um, where it starts out as a robbery and a robbery with, without weapons, for example. But what you find that the prosecution is saying, when one person produces a weapon and someone dies, is that you're still hearing this language of they're obviously in, all in it together or they must have known about the knife. So you've got these, the language of ob objectivity, which is really harking back to the old felony murder rule that was um, abolished in 1957. And it makes it really, really difficult in these types of cases to differentiate between murder and manslaughter. So you've not only got the problem that people who are, in my view, too remote from the killing being convicted, but also no real clear differentiation between murder and manslaughter, which we had hoped Jogi had cured. Add to that, association through music, diet, bias and stereotypes. And you've got the perfect storm of people being labeled as capable of extreme conduct. And if we then approach those remoteness principles in the way that the Court of Appeal appear to be doing, then nothing is off limits. It is effectively assumed or presumed that groups of people of a certain type will be able to foresee, or it won't be too remote to say, that weapons would be used and people would be killed. So effectively, the, the result is that people are being labelled in groups as, if you like, potential killers, or at least um, it's not too remote to consider that these people would be involved in a killing. And that, I think it's easy to say, Lord Toulson would say, is thoroughly unfair, not the way in which we want to hold people accountable. We want to be satisfied so that we're sure that we've got the right people and that the, the rest are um, not treated in the same way, certainly when we have mandatory sentencing. Other problems, for example, are that what might have been called a violent disorder where everybody is fighting that always looks really bad it does look really bad when you're watching it on the CCTV, but really is most likely to be a violent disorder because people can be seen engaging in certain conduct. For example, if they're punching someone else, then they're, they're sucked in to the group and violent disorder becomes murder for everyone. And we get to the point as we are now where we start building super courts that are labelled courts for gang related matters and all of those people involved in a fight end up in the dock being accused of murder and it's it's a real battle 
to try and either get a judge or a jury to see that there's a different role for each person and some some of them are not guilty of any criminal activity at all or might be in the fray but that's not normally on the indictment and uh, these problems also persist in policy because if the law is going to be so broad those working in policy who know the issues around uh, disability race um, class ghettoization use of music and so forth those in policy who know these are issues that arise in joint enterprise cases particularly joint enterprise murder should have a very tight framework as to who will be charged and who won't and that doesn't exist if you look on the cps webpage there's a lot of law on what the law is, and they've obviously been off to a lot of experts to tell them what the law is, but there isn't a great deal of policy on who will be charged and who won't. So again, you've got an assumption or a presumption that anybody even loosely involved in a fatal incident is going to be equally charged, usually with murder. Very rare to see the charge as manslaughter or an alternative charge of violent disorder although there is there are some cases where violent disorder is now agreed as an alternative plea but then you have the worry that people are pleading guilty to something they haven't done just because of fear of a murder conviction so the problems post jogi are not merely the breadth of the law that is not following what jogi said when i thought i'd fixed it and we're going to have to do a jogi too um but also that the policy approach is really really poor especially when a lot of these cases involve children cps has been actually quite good about policy relating to not charging children but weirdly not in this circumstance um, so it's a really uncomfortable situation for us to be in as lawyers and a really frightening situation for many parents thinking about what might happen to their children if they go out in groups and obviously, most of you who know me have, know that Jogi for me was always about the mums who were watching their children being wrongly, wrongfully convicted. And I think there's an added problem for the profession, for my profession. One of the problems of telling my profession that there was an error of law for 30 years is that it means that those people working in the profession got the law wrong for 30 years. Now, not everybody did. Of course, they recognised the injustice that occurred in Chen Wing Su and in the case of Powell and English. But ultimately, as I said in the Supreme Court, some people have always asked me, well, why did you name other barristers in the Supreme Court? And it was to try and say, look what happens if you don't have a confined uh, legal framework. What happens is you get over enthusiastic prosecutors. And unfortunately, trying to get my profession to admit it was wrong for 30 years is pretty tough. And what you now have is those people who worked in an environment where the law was uh, very broad, where the mens rea was reduced from intention to foresight, still want it easy. So you get certain types of people who are still opening cases, and I can tell you I've been in them when they open the cases in exactly the way they did for the last 30 years. And of course, those same people are now sitting as judges. Now, I think a lot of the judges are engaged. They are the people who have to sentence these children or young people um, or adults with learning disabilities or um, a range of people of colour and I think judges are engaged but plainly uh, are not getting the guidance that they need from the Court of Appeal and where the bar for OSA overwhelming supervening act is so high the consequence is that we simply don't have a fair system that allows us to differentiate between those who particularly in joint enterprise murder, if you want to still call it that, those who are in fact the killers, those who may uh, uh, be, have expected or um, as the uh, cases have said, could 
but where excuse me i'm tripping over myself now but where at least some harm is a, a reasonable escalation so they might be manslaughter and those who are not uh, responsible at all and you can think about all those young people who are on the periphery of the group might be there might do not very much and then run away and we've got cases like that many many times where people people have not done very much at all. And I think it's really interesting to think about the case of Field that we heard about at the end. In between Kennedy and Field is my case of Rebello on, uh, on causation and autonomy. That test of free, informed and deliberate was discussed in a gross negligence manslaughter case called Rebello, Rebello 1 and Rebello 2. And I think field is really interesting because it plays into this idea that we don't necessarily want to criminalise people by omission, but it doesn't really discuss how someone could be directly responsible. So as Beatrice has told us, there are these problems that field is not solving, that the case of Taz is not solved, uh, solved. And of course, there may well be a, a bunch of cases that have been to the Court of Appeal that could solve this, but we have this significant problem with applications for leave to appeal being refused. Now, I don't know what the figures are. I suspect anecdotally, um, well, I know anecdotally the answer is high, that most people are being refused leave, and there's an occasional case that's referred to the full court, and then the full court refuses leave, and as we know, we have this dysfunctional system where the Supreme Court has said it is functus to oversee these cases, which means that none of those people who are refused leave can get to the Supreme Court to say, hang on a minute, we think it's all going wrong and we can't, we can't get access to justice for you to tell the Court of Appeal that it's all going wrong. So it's a real denial of access to justice. I think the way through is to have a client with a disability. So you can say, well, hang on a minute, you've got to give me leave because my client's human rights are being affected or in relation to uh, people of colour, that you can say that the large proportion of people being affected are black and therefore there's a discrimination issue. I think we've got a lot more work to do on those broader problems of myths and stereotypes and tropes that are feeding into this assumption and presumption that anyone who gets involved in this type of fight where someone dies would consider the outcome to be foreseeable and I simply am not prepared to accept a that that's true or b that it's fair. Um, the examples I've given today are all examples from cases I've been involved in they're all pretty horrendous so um, some of them are on appeal I'll give it a try but I do think if you're listening in and your lawyers or your policy makers, you really need to think about how we are going to confine liability to those who are truly criminally responsible. There's something wonderful about the common law that allows us to be fair. And it is perfectly obvious that the system at the moment is not fair. And that isn't fair to not just to those people who are accused, but for those people who are victims of crime or families of victims of crime, they don't want to be for the wrong people to be responsible for their loved one's loss. So um, particularly where you have people in the same community and their children have all been involved, perhaps on either side of a fight, you can start to see how the parents are really worried collectively about their children rather than being on one side or another. And I think in court, we still have people on one side or another and not, we're not working towards just and fair outcomes. OK, so time wise, um, we've got about 10 or 15 minutes until uh, we do to finish. So we've got time for uh, some Q&A if you've got some questions. I'll just have a look in the chat and see if there's some questions for either myself or Beatrice. Just bear with me a second. I've got to open the chat. Where's it gone? <laughs> oh, because I scrunched down my Zoom to see my notes and now I can't see the chat. Sorry about that. Just bear with me a second. All right. So uh, Lauren's cat's joining in. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. Welcome to the cat. Um, we've got some comments 
Charlotte's here. Hello, Charlotte. So while you're all thinking of your questions, uh, do feel free to use the emoji reactions at the bottom and put your hand up. I'll put myself on. Well, I can't do it. I was going to put myself on the view so I can see you all. So I'll have to scroll across. But if you put your little emoji hands up or shout out if I'm not seeing you or write in the chat. But while you're doing that, I think I'll say this. I'm acutely aware that the Jengba campaign is ramp ramping up again. It was six years last week that the Jogi decision was handed down. And the numbers are still high of people being convicted in multi-handed defendant cases. And there are a lot of stories of real problems in those, in those cases. So I hope that this um, Libertas lecture from Beatrice is useful for those of you who are concerned about the way your loved one's trial has gone or is going or may go in the future. These are the sort of issues that we all need to raise to try and get courts to think about well, what is this person's connectivity to this crime um, and how should overwhelming supervening act work. Anecdotally, I can tell you when I raised it in oh, October 2020, the judge said, interrupted me. I said, so overwhelming supervening act is a question of, and he interrupted me and said causation. And I said, well, not quite. I think it's actually remoteness. And Beatrice and I had been talking about it. So I actually got to say it in court. And the judge was really engaged and he did leave the question to the jury and the jury did acquit. And in that case, my client, it was a good example, actually. It's a shame the Court of Appeal didn't use it as an example. They couldn't think of one. But my client was accused of being a drop-off driver, dropping off people, so drugs, or was he dropping them off to have a fight? Now, on first blush, you can think, well, if you can't put a pin between the two, then you can't exclude the realistic possibility that he was dropping them off for a fight. Uh, sorry, you can't. In which case, direction should help. If, and in that, in that case, and I have to say in uh, five out of the last eight murder trials at Ireland and Wales, all of the judges have forgotten this bit of Kilbourne. It, they all, get to say it must be strong enough to exclude realistic possibilities. Now there's a debate as to or not that's replaced reasonable doubt because we now use the word sure. I don't want to have that debate today. I think the two things that worry me is first of all that judges don't seem to be giving the whole circumstantial evidence direction but secondly that if they do, they might think that that's enough without an overwhelming supervening act direction. So I think the steps that you need to take as a practical guide, if you're a lawyer and you're dealing with these cases, either in the police station or in court, is to say, well, um, when you get to this point, can you exclude a realistic possibility? What's the actual prosecution case? What demand some particulars what are they saying about the case against you so that you can counter that case and you you can call for particulars ask you always make a submission at half time and raise the fairness issue raise limb two limb two has to be operative think about what a reasonable escalation would be if you don't use those tropes if we say, well, hang on a minute, if this isn't a gang, if we're leaving the question of gang and we're leaving all these other questions to the jury, if they're not resolved, maybe what we've got here is no case to answer. Make the judges do some work. And in most of the cases I've been in, I'm often the only one who's making a submission of no case to answer. And it can be quite a fraught affair because even if there's just some evidence, judges appear to be trained to say, well, it's a matter for the jury, it's your constitutional right to be tried by a jury. We're going to let the jury decide. Juries are really important. But what they're forgetting is their own function as lawyers at the close of the prosecution case. They're really important to challenge uh, 
the judges as a question of law at that close of the prosecution case and possibly again at the close of the defence case and I have seen that recently as well I've seen defence counsel raising a no case to answer at the end of the defence case as well but really getting the judges to do some work as between murder manslaughter or something that's not on the indictment um, and that will help frame the legal directions I've certainly had a case in which the judge has um said they won't give a circumstantial evidence direction at all, which I think is an additional problem. So um, think of overwhelming supervening acts as remoteness and come back for our next lecture on authorization. I think that's our next topic, isn't it? We haven't talked about that for quite a long time. We talked about it a lot and put it in our submissions. So um, some questions in the chat now. Um, Jan's asking, now this goes back to some of these cases pre-Jogi, so Beatrice, this might be a, a question you may or may not be able to answer. If, if you can answer it, I know you've worked at the CCRC, so if you can't, don't answer it. Jan's saying, where does my son Jordan Cunliffe go? He's blind, he's been refused an appeal, the CCRC refused his application, we judicially reviewed their decision and lost again, I know all too well how people are being denied justice, but is there another angle we can think about? Jordan was only 15 years old and at the time blind. Okay, so that it's not necessarily an issue of, um, we're not necessarily talking about the CCRC today, but I perhaps if I can switch your question around a little bit, Jan, I'll, I'll answer your question directly, but for Beatrice, Imagine we had another Jordan Cunliffe now. What are the risks for a blind boy involved with a group um, in where someone dies? What are the risks in the framework that you've just told us about? I, I had to unmute myself there. Um, I think the, there are several risks um, uh, what can be shown to to have uh, happened and what the level of involvement is. Um, obviously, uh, in, in a post jogi world, uh, the first thing that the prosecution would need to uh, establish is that there was this elusive connecting link and some act of assistance or encouragement that was rendered with the intention to assist and encourage um, the perpetrator's uh, act of uh, causing GBH at the least or um, to kill. So um, one would hope that in a post jogi world, um, the prosecution would need to sort of move a bit harder, that there is this, this connecting link, that there actually was an act of assistance and encouragement, and not just someone being present, being around with friends, being associated uh, with others who um, end up uh, causing that fatality. Uh, so the act of assistance and encouragement, that sort of connecting link, that felicity, uh, mentioned earlier on, uh, often is very tenuous uh, still. One would hope that there is some uh, leverage there to sort of make the prosecution think harder about what precisely it is that um, uh, such a, a so-called participant in the violence was actually doing in terms of assisting or encouraging. Um, and then obviously in terms of the overwhelming supervening act, um, you haven't really uh, sort of um, specified very much solicity in terms of what kind of uh, incident we, we, we're talking about but let's say it is an incident of escalating violence there was initially some kind of contribution but then the question is is that what afterwards happened is it so extraordinary that really we can no longer say that whatever the contribution to the initial acts of violence may have been that that should still be seen to matter in light of what happened thereafter so I think there is a number of, of, of risks, but also a number of, I don't want to call it opportunities, but um, things that where we really need to look at uh, whether uh, there really is that connection between what maybe was done in the initial states of the incident and what actually um, happened afterwards. Thanks, Beatrice. Yeah, look, I, I, the way I think that 
is this, um, and I will answer your question, Jan, I promise, but just on this topic, if we had another Jordan, um, I, I really like the overwhelming Superveniac test because um, it's funny in the sense that it's the Supreme Court trying to use ordinary language. When they say um, it, you have to put yourself in, your, in, your, in the accused shoes, that's them trying to use ordinary language. And of course it gets lost because it's not very ordinary. And I was in a trial where the prosecution said, well, that's not easy language. Your honor should come up with something simpler. And I said, well, that is, that is the ordinary language because the more complicated language is remoteness. And it was perfectly plain that the prosecutor didn't know what I was talking about at all. Um, but the judge did. And again, I was, happier in a couple of cases that judges did at least know what I was talking about but I think that phrase that they use is really interesting in Jordan's case because if you put yourself in a blind boy's shoes that sounds like a jury speech but actually it's what you've got to ask the judge to do at half time it's a remoteness principle put yourself in a blind boy's shoes in that in that blind boy's shoes, actually, in many ways, you know, had he been a regular fighter? Was he hanging around with those people all the time? Did they always get into fights? Did they all carry knives? Did he know they all carried knives? All of those questions are what you should be asking at the, at the close of the prosecution case. We all put ourselves in the shoes of a 15 year old blind boy. And if we do, including the prosecutor, then we ought to be getting judges to, to stop cases at half time far more regularly. Now, of course, what many people would say is, oh, that sounds like a jury speech, Miss Derry. And it is. And hopefully when you make your speech to the jury, you can persuade the jury to put themselves in your client's shoes, in your blind boy's client's shoes, and they won't convict. But unless you've got that framework that allows judges to consider it as a matter of law, and juries to consider overwhelming supervening acts, juries to consider what's fair, so that you leave the question of overwhelming supervening acts to the jury and you say, put yourself in his shoes. Is he really a murderer? Is it manslaughter? Or is it nothing? What can you be sure about? It, you know, it's a great jury speech to give, but I, it's one that I hope I don't have to give in the case of a blind child, because I would hope that the judge would uh, intervene at the close of prosecution case. So that's for if we had Jordan Cunliffe now, I can't say that the outcome would be any different given what's going on at the moment in the criminal justice system. In terms of where Jordan could himself could go now, having been convicted and appealed and uh, not been successful, I think there's a lot of work to do around the rights of persons with disabilities. I think there are a lot of people in prison who have disabilities, a lot of people who have been convicted of, we'll call it joint enterprise murder for the sake of a label, who have disabilities and real concerns about the circumstances in which they've been convicted. So I think there's some real work to be done about the rights of persons with disabilities in those circumstances. Some of you might have read the petition for Alex Henry, petition for mercy that deals with autism as a disability and I know we've got Clara Lely in the audience today who is an expert in autism. Um, blindness obviously, obvious disability. So I think there's some work to be done. I think the way in which we approach uh, complicity perhaps ought to be looked at uh, by those bodies that are concerned with uh, persons with disabilities and running some human rights arguments uh, for those persons who do have diagnosed disabilities. And certainly I'm trying to run those arguments in three cases on autism. Um, but I, I think at the moment it needs a bank of people with disabilities who've been convicted on the wrong law to consider where they could seek um, a, an opinion on their on the effect on them as disabled persons. And there are, of course, UN committees that could give opinions. Um, so I'd, I'm certainly not gonna give any advice today, but I do think it's a point at which at some point there are committees, rights-based committees that ought to be engaged on these 
these topics, whether it's committees relating to race or committees re relating to disability. My view as a whole is we should, the moment Jogi was decided, we should have audited all the prisons. We should have worked out who shouldn't be there. The same as I always say, we should audit prisons for those persons who are trafficked and shouldn't be there. We shouldn't wait for them to put their hand up to ask for legal assistance. We should actually go in and see who we've got in prison, who's disabled, who's at least saying they're wrongly convicted, um, who is a joint enterprise prisoner because we haven't kept the records properly, were they a principal, were they accessory, do they have a disability, are they a person of colour, what are the numbers? And unless we do all of that, we've got ongoing miscarriages of justice and we're not protecting the human rights of people like children who have a disability like being blind. So um, Jan, there's a lot for you to think about. I don't think I can say any more today. It's, um, I hope that's helpful for those of you who are interested in human rights issues that intersect with questions of criminal law. Charlotte Henry in our chat is saying something more is sorely needed. Is it more appropriate to demand overt encouragement and assistance as opposed to presence or demanding legal causation? Would it stop liability based on bad thoughts? Yeah, look, there's some big questions in there, um, Charlotte. I don't think we, I, I, Lord Tolson was lovely and it's terrible that we lost him, but I think he had these lovely thoughts of being fair and somehow he didn't realise how unfair people can be and that's what you need law for. The law needs to be there in a framework to stop what I call the knitters at the guillotine, stop people doing terrible things to other people. And at the moment, we don't have a very strong uh, legal framework. So I hope you've all enjoyed it. I think we're about at time now with four minutes over. Well, we started two minutes late. I hope that answers some of your questions. We, I do these webinars about once a month. The next one I, is with uh, Lucy Baldwin, on, Dr. Lucy Baldwin on financial crime and pregnancy in prison sending women into prison for financial offending, including high value fraud. We've got some terrible stories for you there. Um, also children walking into prison, but like, we're going to focus on pregnancy with, with, um, with Lucy. So I think it only remains for me to say, thank you so much, Beatrice, for giving up your evening to give us that expert lecture on joint enterprise and causation. Um, I love the title. I think the, we see the words nexus, there's a nexus, and we see the words ample evidence all the time, and they mean nothing. They're not terms of art, they're not legal terms. They're a fudge by the court to not have a legal framework. And it really is time that the uh, senior courts step up as lawyers and not um, uh, being so quite so keen on factual tests that give us no bright line of where to go. Right. Well, that's that's me for today. Beatrice, thank you so much uh, for being our academic member, for giving us the lecture. And we look forward to seeing you in about another six months time. I think we we call on you about every six months, don't we? That's absolutely fine. I'm looking forward to it. And thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. I've really enjoyed this and I really hope it will uh, to people generally and informative. And yeah. Wow. Thanks. Thank Beatrice. you very much. Felicity. You're welcome. I should say uh, what we normally do is write this up as a short blog style article for Libertas Lens and then we attach the slides so you will get Beatrice's slides and the webinar was recorded so that will go on the Libertas YouTube channel. I've done my bit now and the clerks will be pleased with me. Thank you very much everyone. I'm going to switch us all off now. Beatrice, I'll see you soon. Take care. See everyone. you soon. Thank bye you everyone. Bye. bye. bye.